Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special webinar presentation this afternoon, very proudly brought to you by the ARB Group. Today we'll be covering Road Lighting 101, so, so basically a, an, an overview of, of road lighting. ARB hasn't um, done much training or webinars in this space for the last few years at least, and so it's with great pleasure um, that I also introduce our webinar presenter today, James Kerner, who, um, who's been working with me on putting this uh, material together for you. Uh, that's James's details there, and I'll be giving a uh, brief introduction on him in a few moments' time after we've covered off a few of the formalities, and those are, of course, the housekeeping items. So my name is Angela Juhas, and I will be your friendly moderator this afternoon. Please feel free to touch base with me with any webinar-related uh, feedback, questions, concerns, anything you like. We're always happy to take your feedback on board. Next slide, please, James, if you wouldn't mind. Now, just regarding those housekeeping items. So today we've got approximately 60 minutes for this session. Now, if we have an interactive uh, audience and you ask lots of questions, we might stay back a little bit longer to take those. Anyone, of course, needing to leave, please do, as we do record the sessions and we do also send out the presentation material once the webinar has concluded. So as I was saying, if webinars are interactive, they're a lot more enjoyable. So your question box, which you'll find there in your control panel, that's where we'd like you to type your questions today. And just to give everyone a little bit of uh, practice or get those um, wrists and fingers moving, if everyone would like to type into their question box uh, your name and where you're joining us from today, that will be great. We'll tally those at our end. Now, as I promised, I will talk a little bit more about our presenter today, um, and he is, of course, James Kerner, as I've mentioned before. Now, James uh, works at Power Plant Project Services, which is based here in Melbourne. James has extensive experience in design of lighting installations for Vic Roads, local government, and other public authorities. This includes freeways, major arterial roads, local roads, and other open space areas such as car parks and pathway lighting in parks. James has experience in preparing plans for metered lighting installations in accordance with the uh, Australian New Zealand uh, 3000 standards, I hope I've uh, read that out correctly, and unmetered installations for all of the Victorian distribution companies. So I warmly welcome James to the studio as well as our audience and thank you to those of you who have uh, typed into the questions box. We've got a nice uh, audience here covering all regions of Australia by the looks of it. So thank you, Hugh. Uh, he's also from Victoria. Uh, Spencer, thank you. Uh, Ashik, who I believe uh, may be one of your uh, colleagues over there at Power Plant. Uh, Andrew, thank you, Andrew. John McDonald from WA. Great to hear from you all, and we hope that uh, you continue to use that questions box as we are more than happy to take your questions along the way. So, James, I'm sure everyone is very keen to learn a little bit more about road lighting and, and how it might relate to them. So can you tell us uh, a little bit more about yourself and what you'll be covering in today's presentation? Great. Okay. No worries. Um, so a little bit of background on myself. I started out at Dick Roads. Um, over 10 years at Vic Roads, finished up looking after public lighting policy and design there. Then spent a short time in a traffic engineering consultancy, John Piper Traffic, where I predominantly did public lighting design. And since then I'm now at Power Plant, where I'm part of a small public, uh, public lighting design team, which and all we do is public lighting design, and, and that can range from freeway design detailed design, concept designs, arterial road designs, um, and designs for local councils, you know, um, um, LATMs, small roundabouts, etc. So we, as, from a public lighting design point of view on the roads, we do everything from the very smallest one to the largest one. We do a little bit of car park lighting as well, um, a little bit of open space lighting, but we don't sort of do anything in the area of sports field lighting or, or, or extensive tunnel lighting either. Anyway, so that's a bit of a background about um, what I do and, and what we do and um, we've got a lot to get through so we might as well um, get stuck into it. 
Now, we do have a lot to get through, so I'm talking fairly fast or being overly brief in, in some areas, you know, it's because of the amount of content that we've got, not because I've had too many cups of tea or I'm trying to avoid a particular area. Um, so if you do have any questions, feel free to send them through to Angela and at each sort of at the end of each sort of you know main section we've got a spot there where we can expand upon any of the particular areas if <coughs> that's what you'd like to do. So without further ado, um, we have the overview screen in front of us. So we're going to start off with a little bit of an introduction, talk about a couple of the main terms, um, talk about some of the, the fittings, the, you know, the poles, the brackets, etc. that you might um, that you'd expect to see on a public lighting installation job. We'll have a little bit of a chat about legislation, standards and guidelines. Um, then we'll talk uh, how lighting fits into the overall road design or project design process. We'll go through a couple of the, the common mistakes that, that I come across um, more often or more often than others. And we'll finish off with a, a little bit on some of the, the new trends that are sort of happening in the, in the lighting world. Anyway, so lighting terminology and common lighting fitting. From There's lots of terminology involved in, in lighting and we could spend a lot of time going through all of it. But the main terms that I think we need to know are illuminance and luminance and actually understanding the difference between the two. So illuminance is the light shining down onto a surface, and that surface can be either horizontal or vertical, um, and the units for that are lumens per metre squared. The pavement luminance is the light that is reflected back up off a surface, so in this case with road lighting it will be the road surface, and it's in a direction, so to in a particular direction to a position where the observer is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So candelas are the light emitted in a particular direction, so it's got a directional component. So hence, you know, the observer position in luminance. Um, and lumens is the total light um, of a source or the total light in a particular area. So for instance, with, with the luminance, it's, you know, lumens per, per metre squared. So talking about pavement, pavement luminance before, um, the mid-block sections of road you design to in for pavement luminance, and that has an observer position which is you know 60 metres away from the area that you're designing for. Um, so you have light that comes down from a, a light that's on a pole and a bracket, so it has a certain overhang over the road. It hits the road surface and then it's reflected back to that observer position. And pavement luminance and <coughs> The difference between that and illuminance is something that I often find people um, get confused about. Anyway, so I thought it was worthwhile going through those two. Illuminance, luminance. Lighting categories. That's another one that often sort of comes up. So you have a number of lighting categories within the Australian standards. There's V category, which is the major roads and freeways, arterial roads, freeways. P category standards which are for minor roads, car parks, activity areas, um, underpasses, stairways, that type of thing. Um, more recently there's now a TU series of categories and that's for tunnels and underpasses. Okay, so talking about some of the fittings that we use on a public lighting job. Um, there's poles, brackets, luminaires, distribution boxes and then all the underground stuff. So talking about poles, the, if we were going to split poles into a couple of categories, you're most likely going to split them up and say there's frangible poles with basic impact absorbing and then rigid poles. And I've listed a couple of the types of rigid poles there that you come across, joint use signal, um, power poles that you might mount lights on, the poles that are mounted on concrete barriers um, and they're you know, rigid poles. So normally you, know, you try and use as many frangible poles as possible on a job Sometimes you have to use rigid poles or it's more beneficial to use a rigid pole if you can combine a public lighting pole and a traffic signal pole. That's a better outcome than having two, two lighting poles, or two poles, I should say. So frangible poles, slip base, which is on the left, and impact absorbing, which is on the right in this diagram. So the slip base pole 
is designed to shear at the base when it's hit by a car. Its um, method of electrical protection is that the electrical cables are disconnected. There's a little male-female plug that's in line with the shear with the slip plane on a slip-based pole. When the when the pole shears, the electricity is disconnected to the pole. The car drives through underneath the pole and the pole then falls down. Normally it falls down pretty close to where the pole was. An impact absorbing pole is designed to crumple and it slowly or more slowly brings the car to rest. Um, um, hopefully with um, ho hopefully not um, I'm struggling for, my right, for the right words here, but it, 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 it crumples around the car, brings the car to rest, hopefully not injuring the vehicle occupants. Um, in an impact absorbing pole, the electrical cables are protected by a conduit that runs internally within the pole. Okay, slip based poles. Slip based poles are generally used in high speed areas where there's little or low pedestrian activity where you're clear from overhead power lines or other other um, items that you want that you don't want a pole coming into contact with, so for instance um, railway tracks. Um, and and slip based poles are really, for my um, my in my opinion, are the first pole of choice for a public lighting. Design. So if you're in if you're in an area where there's nothing else sort of interacting with the lighting pole, slip based pole, in high speed areas they're by far and away the safest type of pole. So an impact absorbing pole, and this one here, you can tell the difference between an impact absorbing pole. It's got perforations in the um, side of the pole. Instead of having a round circular base with a slip plane, it's got a it's got a um, rectangular base with four bolts. You know, an impact absorbing pole. We use those in low speed areas um, where there's where there are pedestrians. In narrow medians or other areas where there's a risk of a slip based pole being struck and then causing a secondary impact, if that if that's a risk, you use an impact absorbing pole. Um, or where there's reduced clearance to overhead power lines. So in this case, you can see this base pole is probably being reversed into by a car and a little bit damaged, probably in need of replacement. And the reason they will have used the slip base, I mean, an impact absorbing pole here, will be because it's a slightly narrower medium than what was in the previous presentation. Um, the speed environment is important to note for for slip base poles and impact absorbing poles. We say low speed environments. In low speed environments, if a car strikes a slip based pole, there's no guarantee that the car will actually clear the area where the pole was struck before the pole lands on top of it. And I have seen videos from one of the one of the guys in Vic Roads where a car has struck a slip based pole um, in a low speed environment and the pole's actually landed on top of the car. So you need to be mindful of that when choosing the right pole type as well. Poles, rigid poles. Probably the one of the more common rigid poles that you're going to come across in the public lighting scheme is going to be joint use signal pole, although distribution poles and power poles are, um, are fairly common as well. Rigid pole, you know, you, you use a rigid pole where you've got a barrier and you don't need to have a frangible pole. If you've got um, a bowl, a pole behind barrier, I should say, um, slip based poles. You know, it's not my preference to use them behind barriers because you've got to go and check the torque of the bolts um, every 12 to 18 months. Um, so you can you can use a rigid pole, and sometimes you know it might be a better maintenance outcome to use a rigid pole in certain areas where they're behind barriers, where you, where you can combine them with um, signal poles or down in Melbourne tram poles, um, or where you just you just can't get clearances to overhead power lines you might consider using a rigid pole. So on the right hand side of the screen there you'll see some high mass lighting that's in the centre median of the Eastern Freeway in Melbourne. Um, they are most definitely rigid poles and originally they were they were considered to be outside the clear zone but um, 
Pick roads retrofitted crash barrier around them because they're having a few fatal crashes on them. Anyway, so you need to be careful about where you're going to place a rigid pole on a public lighting job. Brackets. And brackets come in, there's various types of brackets that you, that you can use in public lighting jobs. On the distribution pole, which is in that tiny splitter island there, there's what we would call a distribution bracket. There's multiple different types of distribution brackets. You can get, you can get cobra brackets, um, inclined arm brackets, um, tramways brackets. Um, but those brackets um, are specially designed for putting on power poles and also depending on which distribution business you're in, you will have a limit on what types of brackets you can use as well. They all have their own brackets that are available for use. Then you've got spigot brackets which go on to um, stand or standalone or specialised public lighting poles. So in this particular diagram, you see here this is a curved spigot bracket which is used by the local Victorian distribution businesses. Um, in the background there, there's a straight spigot bracket which is used predominantly by Vicroads for its metered AS3000 public lighting schemes. Vicroads has certain brackets that are type approved for use. The distribution businesses have different brackets which are type approved for use. You need to be careful if you're doing a Vicroads scheme or a, a road authority scheme that you're using the brackets that they're, that they've said are okay to use. If you're designing for a distribution business scheme, you need to use the brackets that they say are okay to use. Luminaires, probably one of the most important parts, if not the most important part of the public lighting installation. So the luminaire at the top left there is a what you call well what I would call a standard luminaire, it's a semi cutoff luminaire. Um, that is the in Victoria at least that is the majority of the luminaires that you're going to see out, out on the roads. Um, the semi-cut-off luminaire sort of lamp position is slightly lower, slightly more light spill from it, you get better spacings between the luminaires. So as a rule of thumb, you'd expect about six times by the mounting height. So if you've got a 12 and a half metre pole, you'd expect somewhere you know, between 65 and say 80 metre spacings between your lights. On a, on a typical job, depending on the carriageway width. On the right-hand side, we've got what we call an aero screen or a full cut-off luminaire. Um, as much tighter control over light spill, and you'd use those types of luminaires in areas around um, airfields or in residential areas where you're trying to limit light spill. With the full cut-off luminaire, you don't quite get the spacings between the poles that you would on a, a B category lighting scheme anyway. Um, so instead of six times by the mounting height, you know, you, as a rule of thumb, you're probably looking at about four to five times the mounting height as the space in between poles. Okay, on this slide we've got an aero screen luminaire that's got a little bit of extra protection from a light spill point of view. It's got a glare shield on it as well. Um, this particular light is in a railway car park opposite, opposite some residential housing and might have had some complaints from the residents, so they've put some extra um, light spill protection in there. On the right hand side, the different or another form of light spill control, and that's where they've painted the diffuser black on the back of it to, to limit light coming out of the back of the luminaire. In this case, it was used on a freeway ramp where there was a residential residential house that was adjacent to the, to the lighting scheme. This type of luminaire is again even more tightly controlled from a photometric point of view and light spill. That's the type of luminaire that you'd see in car parks in residential areas, or not that I do much much of this design, but you'd also see those types of luminaires in residential tennis courts or in tennis courts. Um, much tighter control of um, light spill. Distribution boxes, um, not applicable for distribution company owned schemes, but if you've got a metered AS3000 scheme, so down here in, in, in Victoria, at least, you know, all of our, our metered, all of our AS3000 schemes, um, well, the majority, as soon as they've got more than two amps of, of, of load, they all have to have a meter in them. You need to have a distribution box. So in, in this one here, you know, the, the upper section here is for the distribution company meter, same as the type of meter that you've got in your house. 
um, down in the bottom is where you've got the switchboard and all the all the all the circuits for the public lighting. Um, you might not need meters in all of the states of Australia. I'm not 100% sure how the other distribution businesses in um, the other states actually um, run public lighting. They might do it by tariff and then all you need is a, a switchboard, you don't need any meter. Okay, some of the underground stuff, pits. You, have, you need pits to put connections in your cables and also to um, fuse poles on distribution company schemes. Down here in Victoria, at least, there's different types of pits. We've got what we call a BESI pit. BESI stands for the Victorian Electricity Supply Industry. Um, it's that smaller concrete pit that's on the left-hand side there. And we have Big Road Standard Pits, which are a larger pit. Um, that's on the right-hand side. Interesting to note that the, the distribution company pits, you know, concrete lids or plastic lids, they're insulated. Big Road's pits have got a metal lid, so generally speaking, the distribution businesses down here don't want or won't allow any electrical connections to be made in a big roads pit because they've got metal lids and if a wire um, connects with the pit lid, then the pit lid is live. Anyway, I'm sure in other in other areas around Australia there'd be different types of pits that you use and some are approved for use, some of them are not. All right, conduits and cables, your typical Electrical conduit that you use underneath the ground is an orange um, HD PVC, so high density PVC conduit. You can see that down the bottom of that photo. There's a couple of those orange orange conduits sticking out. Um, flexible conduit can be used within poles. Often used in Victoria between pits and frangible public lighting poles. Um, we've also got the cables there. That's either single double insulated cable or electrical cable coming out of that flexible conduit. Um, so all of those things are, are used in, in public lighting schemes. Some cables are allowed, um, for instance, your, your road authorities and your distribution businesses will have different standards on what cables you can use on their lighting schemes. So you, again, you need to make sure that you know all of those standards and you need to know the differences between um, a road authority metered installation and distribution company installation. Probably one of the one of the common um, themes through both of those is that your earth wire is, is going to be green in your eyes. Anyway, in Victoria it is anyway. Um, and this particular photo is for an isolation pillar which is part of an unmetered AC thousand scheme in Victoria which is associated with a uh, flashing light through a pedestrian for a pedestrian to the crossing. So again, this is, I guess is an example that um, where the load is low down down here in Victoria, you don't necessarily have to have a meter for an AS3000 scheme, but you do need to have protection, etc., for the cables and um, to comply with AS3000. Anyway, so that's a particular point where we've got a break if anybody wants to ask any questions. Yes, thank you, James. So we've had um, a question here from Edward. So thank you, Edward, for sending that through. Edward's asking, in general, is there a trend towards solar-powered lighting being installed rather than the convention main-powered lighting that we've just gone through? What are your thoughts on that? So solar-powered lighting is being um, combined with LED lights, which draw lower loads um, at the moment and we're starting to see a fair bit of that along parks and pathways and pathways and parks and gardens like the bicycle tracks. Um, it's not yet um, suitable for V category lighting schemes where you've got a much higher level of lighting and you're trying to replace say a, a 250 or a 400 watt higher pressure sodium luminaire which typically draw one and a half to, to um, three amps, you know, per light. Uh, so we're not seeing a lot in the V category space, but we are starting to see more solar-powered lights in parks and gardens. Solar power is also um, suitable for flag lighting in remote, isolated intersections where you don't have a ready LV source. Um, 
one thing to keep in mind with, with solar powered lighting is that solar panels are quite attractive to, to people to steal. So I know that's also created a problem for some of the road authorities in the past. Oh dear, well, wow. okay, that's something important to note. Uh, thank you very much for your question there, Edward. I hope we've uh, answered that sufficiently for you. Another question from Hugh, um, that's in relation to distribution boxes. How many luminaires do they support, or how do you determine how many uh, distribution boxes are required? Okay, so you can theoretically run as many public lighting circuits out of a distribution box as you like. You've just got to make it big enough so that you can fit the circuit protection on there. So um, if it's a three-phase scheme, you, know, you need to be able to fit a three-phase um, residual current device in there for each of the... Actually, there's multiple ways that you can actually wire them up, but let's just say you, know, you can run as many circuits in there as long as you can fit all the protective devices that you need for the public lighting circuit. But there is also another limiting factor for an AS3000 scheme, which is what we're talking about if we're talking about distribution boxes, in that there's a requirement for earth loop impedance for your cables, which basically means that if you get a fault at the end of a lighting circuit, that you get enough fault current to actually trip the protective device in the distribution box. Now, depending on the... Um, circuit breaker rating that you're using that and your cable size, that will limit how far you can run a public lighting circuit and have the protective devices operate effectively. So on, let's say, a, if you're using 16mm cable, you're not going to be able to run much more than about 600 metres to the end of your lighting circuit, which when you, when you go 600 metres each way from distribution boxes, which means that you're going to have to have distribution boxes about 1,200 metres apart. But if you were to run 50 mil cable, then you can go further. Um, so there's a lot of factors in there. Um, when I say you can fit as many public lighting circuits out of the distribution box, that's you know, a theoretical um, assumption. Right? You're probably not going to get more than 10 or so out of there, so that would affect it as well. But generally speaking, the the reasons for having more, you know, the, what will determine how many distribution boxes and how far they are apart will be your earth loop impedance requirements. Um, and maybe also if you wanted to be able to see your luminaires from the distribution box so you can check them from a maintenance point of view to make sure you haven't got blown lamps, that might come into it as well. Great. All right. Thank you, Hugh, for your question. And um, as it, it's almost at the halfway mark, we might move on with the presentation yeah. and the rest of the questions to the end. So thank you to those of you who have sent some through, and we'll address those as soon as we can. Okay. No worries. So now for the exciting part of the uh, the the webinar, it's about legislation. So hands up, everybody who's as uh, excited about legislation as I am when it comes to public lighting. So we'll go through a little bit, touch it briefly on legislation, we'll talk about some key stakeholders, um, road authority standards, important to note when you're doing public lighting design, um, Australian standards and also the distribution standards and uh, guidelines. So each state will have its own legislation covering, covering electrical standards, um, ownership arrangements for public lighting, funding responsibilities for public lighting, um, the lighting in, a, in, a, in its area. So for instance, and I'm, I am going to draw on Victorian examples here because I'm from Victoria, but um, there is Road Management Act talks about cost sharing for lighting, talks about where councils and big roads will look after lighting. There is the Network Safety or the Electricity Safety Act, which talks about you know cabling of lighting installations. Um, there's the Electrical Safety installations regulations which you know make reference to Australian standards and also determine what you need to do. There's also the network asset regulations which you know which basically govern what the distribution businesses need to do. There's also a public lighting code which covers um, and the arrangements between road authorities and the distribution businesses and and 
what they need to do when they're looking after lighting on behalf of the road authorities. Um, key stakeholders, funnily enough, would then be the state road authorities, your local councils, there's your local road authorities, and also then the distribution businesses or the electrical authorities. State road authorities are going to be setting policy and looking after the standards for declared roads and freeways. Uh, local councils will be setting standards for local streets, parks and gardens. So your road authority standards will provide guidance on policy areas that you need to light. So for instance, you know, big roads will say that they want signalised intersections, roundabouts, tram stops, bus stops, um, areas with high crash numbers lit. They'll also accept the extent of lighting. They might defer to the Australian standards, um, for instance, on the approaches to intersections and say we want two spans, or well, they might say we want minimum three spans and 150 metres. At the moment in Victoria, it's two spans and 100 metres on arterial roads three spans and 150 metres on freeway ramps. The road authority is also responsible for setting or specifying what lighting category is applicable for, for a particular road. And they can give you a lot of other, um, or they'll provide a lot of other guidance and requirements on non-electrical, um, I shouldn't say non-electrical, on other aspects of a road lighting installation. So, so for instance, pole setbacks, um, what's the maximum lumens that you can use out of the luminaire, what luminaires that you can use on their schemes. All right. They'll also give you guidance as to what fittings are allowable or available to use on their metered or AS3000 lighting schemes. However, road authorities are not allowed to override any of the electrical requirements that are in any of the regulations or the Australian standards, they don't have that. They don't have that power. Um, they do have the power to sit there and say, "We don't want lighting in accordance with AS 1158. We'll have 30 lux average with a uniformity of 0.3." They are well within their rights to say that. However, they're not allowed to say we're not going to comply with AS 3000 or the electrical standards. Okay. So the lighting Australian standards, there is the, the, probably the, the two most important standards from a public lighting point of view is going to be 1158, parts one to six. That covers all of the lighting requirements, the amount of light, the uniformity of light, whether or not you're designing for vertical or horizontal illuminance. Um, that's all in 1158. I won't go into that too much because we're running out of time. There's also obtrusive light is also an obtrusive light standard. However, that's not applicable to, um, it's not a normative standard for um, V category lighting schemes. It is, however, applicable for things like car parks and residential areas. The other side of things is the electrical standards. AS3000 is probably the most important one from a AS3000 installation point of view. Also, AS3008 gives you some guidance on selection of cables, bolt drop, etc. The AS3000 AS3008 most likely won't apply to any distribution business um, company electrical installations unless they've decided to adopt the Australian standards. Right, which brings me to the distributor guidelines. So in, in Victoria on an unmetered lighting scheme, you need to comply with the distribution company standards and guidelines that will cover not only pole types and luminaire types and bracket types that you can use, it also covers all of the electrical requirements. All right, so that's standards and guidelines and legislation. Have we got any questions on that? Uh, we don't have any questions relating to standards and guidelines, although we obviously welcome anyone with questions to send them on through. Um, just a quick question here from um, Ashik. Sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Terribly sorry about that. Uh, and the question is, um, is it essential to install new, a new pit two metres from the pole? Uh, for a frangible public lighting pole, I, 
I would say that you should, if not have to, install a pit from the pole. The pit needs to be close to the pole um, so that if the pole gets hit and they're out there at night and you know the, the, the installation was installed 20 years ago and the pit's covered in grass, that they've got a chance of actually finding it where they can actually disconnect the cables if they need to. For rigid public lighting poles in a URD scheme, more often, when I say URD, urban residential um, development scheme, so a residential estate, and you, where you've got rigid um, poles within those residential estates, more often than not down here anyway, um, they just loop the cables in and out of the poles and they don't have pits. Um, pits, pits generally you try and minimise the amount of pits because they get, they get damaged by you know, vehicular traffic or grass mowing as well. Um, but next to frangible poles, you, you do want to have a, a pit. Alrighty, thank you for your question. I hope we've answered that sufficiently for you. And um, we do have a couple more. I might save those to the end so we can make yeah, progress into the next chapter. Sorry, An yeah, sorry Angela, I, I, I forgot that you said we hold questions to the end. Right, okay. So, lighting in the road design process. Um, and this is important to consider from a public lighting point of view anyway. It's often pushed right down to the bottom, so if someone from bridge design will probably say public lighting, you don't need to worry about that, just worry about bridges. But I do public lighting, so I like to worry about it a little bit. So when should public lighting design be done? It often needs to be considered early in the process because the public lighting has inputs into things like traffic signals and also bridges. So for instance, if we need to put some lights on bridges, which we try and avoid at all costs normally, they need to know that there's a foundation for light pole that needs to go into a certain part of the bridge and they need to design for it. Um, conduits for lighting often need to be installed early in the process. There's not going to be a road construction contractor out there that likes laying down pavement and then trenching back through it to put in public lighting conduits at a later date. They all want to know where their conduits are going so that they can lay them down as they're building up the road pavement. So while public lighting needs to be considered early on and, and provide input to some of the other components in a road design, we can't finish a public lighting design until they're blocked in things like carriageway width verge width so that we know where we can actually get poles on the side of the road and then determine our overhang when we're doing our spacing calculations. We need all of that. We need to know where the signal conduits are going to go if we're going to be utilising those as part of the public lighting scheme. So we're, we need to wait till all of those items are locked in and finalised before we actually can finalise that public lighting design, which means that whilst it needs to be considered early, the finalisation of the lighting design nearly always happens at the end of the job. As I mentioned, it's relative low cost. Low cost. Um, there's not a lot of knowledge about public lighting in Victoria anyway out there at the moment, so it often is given a low priority. Um, combined with that, on public lighting, when there's you know cost sharing arrangements, so you know part funded by local councils, part funded by the state road authority. There's multiple players that need to be involved in the approval and the acceptance of a proposed public lighting scheme. You can also throw in the distribution businesses there. So there's three key stakeholders that have got to approve a public lighting design. That adds to the delays in getting a lighting design approved. You're already starting or finalising it right at the end of the job, throwing some complicated delays um, or complicated approval processes and that's where you get your delays on a public lighting scheme. Um, distribution businesses or the electrical supply authorities, public lighting can also be a very low priority for them as well. Um, if it's during summertime where they've got bushfires or they've got blown transformers and they've got to worry about those on the network, your public lighting jobs a lot of roundabout on a local road can very quickly become a very low priority for them. So that can often take a long time as well. Right, so for those various reasons, you know, lighting can often delay projects and it's very frustrating for project engineers when you know, a small component of their design is holding up practical completion. Um, design objectives for public lighting. So, and this is my take on it, 
other people might have a slightly different view on, on what are the main design objectives. But for me, it's to meet the clients and the code's requirements from a, a, a lighting category and level point of view. So, you know, we want to meet the illuminance requirements in this section, pavement illuminance at mid-block. If what they want is a code standard lighting scheme, we want to meet that. We want to do that by minimising the amount of lights and the amount of poles, so we keep the capital costs down, also keep the ongoing operational costs down and um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's my take on it. Some people might say that they want to maximise maximise lighting uniformity or provide a Rolls Royce lighting scheme. For me, I want to try and minimise the type of light. It's very important in the lighting design that it is constructible and it's maintainable. So for instance, construction, if you're determining clearances of a public lighting pole, pedestrian crossing pole that you want to stick underneath some HP cables, theoretically you might be able, you might get the regulatory clearance that you need. But you also need to keep in mind that a constructor's got to get a crane truck in there and that there might be a one and a half metre base on the on the bottom of the pole that they've got to lift into a, a um, lift in to actually get that pole in place. Now that might be the difference between actually having maintaining your clearances or hitting the HV power lines that are above there. So you need to keep that in mind, you know, is what you're designing constructible? Is it maintainable? So a, a good example for um, maintainable lighting scheme would be if you're going to put a lighting pole on a on the verge of a steep embankment, is it is there access, you know, do maintenance staff need to jump over um, traffic barriers to actually get to the pole? Can they actually get a maintenance vehicle there to um, get someone up and um, inspect the luminaire, etc.? So um, meet code requirements or client requirements, maximise efficiency and make sure it's constructible and maintainable. Um, I've talked about illuminance and luminance for public lighting designs and I've, I've got a little bit of a diagram here to explain it. So this is a job that we're doing at the moment for the Dingley Bypass in Victoria. The red highlighted line that you can see there is the 7.5 Lux contour, which is the applicable illuminance requirement for Category B3 lighting in accordance with the code. So, and I'm simplifying this, um, prob perhaps not 100% correct the diagram I've got here, but I'm try just trying to keep it simple. Also keep in mind that in, in Victoria we don't necessarily have to have a pole within five metres of a change of carriageway width as required by the code. But anyway, illuminance design, generally speaking illuminance design is going to be in your intersections. There are other areas like island noses, um, uh, roads where the radius of curvature is less than 100 metres, etc., where you also need to do illuminance. But in you know the vast majority of time, you're going to be looking at illuminance in your intersection area, and then you're looking at pavement luminance um, or spacing calculations to determine, to determine how far apart you need to have your light poles on the approaches to the intersections or the mid-block areas. So one of the things I often have to answer on um, lighting designs that I'm handing up to road authorities is why isn't the whole road covered by the 7.5 Lux contour? And the answer to that is you don't need to. So in those areas where we're doing pavement luminance, um, we do that design based on spacing calculations, which I'll show you in a second. And so you can see here the 7.5 Lux contour does not cover the whole road. It does cover the area that we need to around the intersection. So spacing calculations, I've mentioned mentioned those. Um, this here comes out of a, a program called Perfect Light. You put in um, road features like the carriageway width, the mounting height of the luminaire, the type of luminaire, the amount of light that's coming out of the luminaire, the maintenance factor for the luminaire, um, etc., and the lighting arrangement and what you get is a maximum spacing that you can have between poles and then you've got to ensure that you know, when you're designing that you don't have more than that spacing between your poles. So it's important to note, particularly if you're 
uh, road authority and you're receiving public lighting plans, you don't always have to cover the roads with illuminants. Um, there are areas where you do these basic calculations. All right, lighting design. Two worlds of lighting design. There is the lighting layout or the traffic engineering, well, I'm what I'm going to call like a traffic engineering component. How many lights? Where are you going to have the lights? Have you met the lighting levels? Have you got the right uniformity? Right. That's where you're talking about the road authority standards and 1158 and sound traffic engineering practice. Second component of it is the electrical design. We're actually getting power to those lights so that they can, you can actually turn them on. That's where you're talking about AS3000. So for instance, can I run a cable for 600 metres and get to this light? Do I need to, do not, do I need to worry about the, the rating of the protective device? Or the distributor company guidelines, will they allow you to run a conduit or a cable within the concrete barrier on a bridge? So it's very important to keep to keep in mind that actually how many lights and where is only half the problem. And in some in some cases, where you stick the lighting pole is a very small component of the problem. The vast majority of the problem is how you get electricity electricity supply to the pole. Here's an example that we had on a the regional rail job actually is recently completed in um, in Victoria. I say recently completed, the actual civil component of the works was probably completed about six months ago on one of the public lighting installations. We only got that commissioned about um, a month ago, so it lagged it significantly. Um, in this case, it was on Armstrong Road South, and we had a light that we needed to put on a bridge. It probably took me about half an hour to do the spacing calculations and determine we need a light in the middle of that bridge. It took probably six months to get the local distribution business or the electrical authority to approve how we were going to actually get electrical supply to the to the light. And if you have a look on there, you can see there's four details that we've got for the conduits that are running along the outside of that bridge. Um, so there was a lot of detail that went into drawings to actually get electrical supply to that particular light. So we needed to think about things like where were we going to earth the light pole? Normally, down in Victoria, the distribution business would have an earth stake that's a couple of metres away from the pole. You can't do that on a bridge. Um, how do we transition from underground conduits to mechanically protected conduits on the bridge structure? We had to worry about that. That all had to be approved by the standards section in the distribution business. And the distribution businesses are good when you can actually point to a standard and say, we're doing this installation in accordance with your standard. Where you're not doing it in accordance with a published standard, then things become time consuming and difficult to get approvals. So we had to have, we had transitional issues between the underground conduits and the um, conduits on the bridge. We weren't allowed to run the conduits in the bridge barrier. For some reason they had to be externally mounted. Um, when we actually got to the lighting pole itself, we weren't allowed to have another junction box there to transition from the galvanised steel conduits to the flexible um, steel conduits up into the base of the lighting pole. We originally wanted to have a junction box there that wasn't acceptable because there was no maintenance access to the, to the junction box. Um, so we had to decal up the transition conduit between gel steel and flexible. Um, there's two conduits there because you had to run a separate conduit for the earth cable. There were, there were a number of issues that we needed to work through with the distribution business to actually get power to that light. And like I said, the lighting design component of it is easy. The electrical supply component of it is difficult. Um, I'll flip through this and go to some common design mistakes that I often come across when I'm reviewing um, designs for, for people or if in the case, I've got a couple of examples here, it's when um, the road authority has given me a concept design that's been done for them and they've asked me to turn it into a detailed design. These are the types of mistakes I come across. Illuminance versus luminance, I've already talked about it. Um, um, everybody's good at checking isolate spots. 
they're not so great at checking or asking for the spacing calculations and making sure that the actual mid-block sections of the road have been done in accordance with the code. Choosing the right pole. Have you got the right clearances from overhead power lines? Getting the right design. Um, not 100% sure what happens to the other states and territories of Australia, but down here we have um, distribution companies which have their own drafting standards, their own design standards, and if you don't have a plan that's been approved by them for use and an authority to commence construction, you're not building a distribution company public lighting scheme. And it happens all the time. Um, Vic Roads will get a traffic signal plan prepared which will show what needs to happen from where the lights need to go. It won't show how the, the cables are getting there. It won't, they won't have a distribution company um, um, standard plan approved and prepared. Uh, and then they end up having a a, um, a delay on their job because they've got all the traffic signal poles in place but they can't turn on the lights and they can't install the lights in fact. So making sure that you've bought or you've got the right um, design is important as well. Right. So here's an example. It's Old Geelong Road. Um, it's a job where we were given a concept design and we need to turn it into a, a um, detailed design. Perhaps a little bit hard to see but these blue um, symbols here are the lighting poles, right? Highlighted here where the HV, so the 22 kV um, electrical conductors are, so high voltage power lines. And also some information here, we've got some fairly wide carriageway width, so 18 metre, 19, 20 metre wide carriageway width. And we've got a, we've got a pole here that's within 7 metres of the power line. Okay, all the poles in the installation schedule are listed as 12 and a half metre foot base poles. Um, so, this particular pole here is too close to the power line. Each road authority or distribution business may have um, differing standards about how close you can have a frangible pole to an overhead power line. But most of them will say that for a slip base pole it needs to be 1.2 times by the mounting height of the pole if that pole is likely to be impacted in the direction um, or impacted by traffic in the direction of the power line. Sometimes for impact absorbing poles, or sorry, sometimes for slip base poles, if it's not likely that a pole could be impacted towards the power lines, they might let you get away with 0.6 times by the mounting height. The impact absorbing poles, it's always 0 0.6 times by the mounting height. So this particular design, this pole's too close to the power line. That's the slip base pole, it's only 7 metres away, it needs to be 15 metres away, so it's no good. Um, as far as the pavement luminance or the spacing calculations go, um, for the single sided arrangement with 250 watt HPS lights or high pressure sodium lights with 12 and a half metre mounting height, all of those approaches fail. So as far as this design goes, concept design that was done, there's virtually nothing here that you can retain or keep from a detailed lighting design point of view. There's also no um, reference to where you're going to get point of supply. And in this case, the without, without um, some significant distribution company work, the LV point of supply was a couple of hundred metres away. So this here is what our detailed design ended up looking like. So you can see that we've got an opposite arrangement on the approaches. Um, the road authority also decided to signalise the intersection so there were some changes that we could make part of that. We were able to put a, a joint use signal pole in there which made it a rigid pole. You didn't need to keep the same clearances from the overhead power lines. Uh, again, an opposite arrangement through here. We were constrained a little bit about what we could do in this area because of the um, HV, so we had to keep it as a single-sided arrangement. And instead, we decided designed for um, pavement. Sorry, for illuminance through there, not pavement luminance. Through here, we had um, poles in the centre median with double outreach brackets on it. So, from a road authority um, pricing up this job what they would have had to pay for at detailed design is significantly different for what they would have allowed for at concept design. Um, and 
Um, yes, so concept design wasn't that great. Anyway, that that covers off a few things, um, common mistakes, the spacing calculations or the pavement movements on the approaches to intersections and clearance to power lines. Also, it's not shown on this plan. Um, oh, yes, it is. Sorry. So down here to get LV, right? We had to put a new uh, what they call a um, service T joint on the distribution company's mains cables, right, so that we had point of supply for the lighting as well as the traffic signals. This here is a, uh, another example, again, concept design that we were given um, to turn into a, a detailed design um, from someone in Rome, Victoria. Um, 66 kV line, so high voltage power lines running through here. Um, to the right hand side of the screen it was a 300 metre span across a local creek. So it's a very long span, anybody that knows anything about um, overhead power design, the longer the span, the more sway that you need to allow for in the conductors. Um, I haven't talked about conductor sway but we don't really have time to go into that. Anyway, um, we've got lighting poles that are very close to the um, the conductors. There's one pole here that's a little bit further away, six metres, but again that's why I was mentioning the sway. Um, on that particular span there was I think about five and a half metres of um, design sway in the conductors at that particular location because the actual pole, um, actual power pole is up around here on the other side of the intersection. Also VicRoads has a requirement for a minimum of 100 metres or two spans of approach lighting to an intersection. This arguably has two spans because you've got a staggered arrangement with two spans there. But it's only 42 metres, so it's half the um, allowable arrangement. And this pole here you can't install anyway because it's too close to the power lines. Um, there's guardrail over here which is clashing with um, existing guardrail which is clashing with this proposed pole that they're nominating there. All of the poles uh, 250 watt um, or 12 and a half metre impact absorbing poles. So the minimum clearance you need between the pole and the electrical conductors is seven and a half metres. Keep in mind where I've said three metres or five metres there, but that's to the centre line of the conductors. So you've got to allow for conductor spread as well, which typically is about 1.3 metres in Victoria. So all of those poles are way too close, way too close to the HP power lines and as a result you can't construct them um, and again that goes back to whatever you design you've got to make sure that it is constructible. Um, talked about all those problems and they're not being the required 100 metres approach lighting and they're clashing with the guardrail. So it's a little bit hard to, to read here but this is what the design ended up being. So in this area we used 400 watt luminaires. Um, the residential areas of housing um, were either remote from the road or um, at a much higher level, so light still wasn't so much of an issue, so we were allowed to go with a higher pole and a uh, 400 watt luminaire, and we kept the lighting just to one side of the road, we utilised some um, poles in the centre median of the island and some joint use signal poles. Um, here on the approach we need to push that pole back um, further away from the power lines and again over here to avoid clashes with the guardrail we um, use poles on the other side of the road. Pole selection um, is one of the important things to keep in mind when you're doing public lighting schemes. So probably the, 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 um, the two most important things are you know, slip based poles around overhead power lines, you know, if you haven't got the right clearance you need to look at an impact absorbing pole or also use impact absorbing poles around um, areas where there's a lot of pedestrian activity. This particular example, maybe perhaps not a lighting example, but that is an impact absorbing pole that has got overhead conductors, a cross arm and overhead conductors installed on it. So, for instance, in a local street, if someone ran into that, ran into that lighting pole, they're going to actually bring down the um, distribution power lines as well. 
that was uh, was in City Power's area. Um, you know, I saw that walking home from the restaurant one day. We reported that to City Power. They had it fixed and changed probably within a week, and they replaced that with a standard distribution pole. Um, clearances to overhead power lines. That's probably one of the other main um, problems that we see. This case is in an um, arterial road in Victoria. That's an impact absorbing pole that's um, within a couple of metres of the of an island node and it's within about one and a half metres of the overhead conductor. So I can't see any way that that pole could be hit and not actually contact or bring down those electrical conductors. So that's a particularly bad example. But it's, you'd be surprised if you're actually looking for this type of stuff. You see it all over the place. This here's a photo um, of actually when I was on my honeymoon. The wife was more than happy to actually turn the car around so that I could take a photo of a public lighting pole. Um, so that is a slip based pole that is not only hard up on back of curb, but it's also squeezed in between the curb and the overhead conductors. Again, if that pole gets hit, it's going to interact with the electrical conductors and that is not a good thing. So not only is it a high risk because it's so close to the to the actual roadway, but it's also very close to the power lines as well. Some new, tr new trends in, in lighting, I suppose this is a, a, a bit of a topical um, slide to, to finish off our, our discussion today. But LED, everybody's talking about LED light um, on, for, for public lighting and LED is the way of the future, there's no doubt about it and it is a rapidly emerging technology. LED are now currently probably the go-to light in local streets where you've got lower lighting levels. Um, at the moment in Victoria, Sylvania or Gerard have an 18 watt LED that gets uh, LED luminaire that supposedly you stick it up, you don't have to worry about it for 20 years. It's 18 watts. A year and a half ago it was 28 watts. Um, 10 years ago we were using 80 watt mercury vapor luminaires in residential streets. So in a short period of time you've more than you've reduced the amount of power you're using by, you know, um, uh, a quarter, right? Um, Vic Roads at the moment has an LED luminaire that's suitable for replacing the 250 watt high pressure sodium luminaires, but they don't yet have one approved for use that's um, suitable for replacing 400 watt and higher luminaires. I'm not saying that they're not out there at the moment down here, they're not approved for use. With LEDs, I guess one of the things you need to keep in mind they don't have quite the same school characteristics as um, HID or high intensity discharge lighting, so your uh, metal halides and your high pressure sodium luminaires. So if you're using them on pathways, etc., you know the surrounding areas can appear dark, so they don't get the same light spill. Or if you're using them on um, V category roads, you might not get the same light spill that you would normally get onto the footpath area. So you need to be a little bit careful. There needs to be some thought put into that space. Um, the standards really are, in my opinion, are, are, are racing a little bit to catch up with LED because it is just progressing so quickly. <coughs> One of the other areas in public lighting at the moment which is um, looking like it might get some legs is um, smart PE cells. So PE cells traditionally turn the lights on at a certain light level, turn them off, so they turn them on at when when the ambient um, illuminance was 15 lux, turned them off when, when it was 30 lux. Nowadays, PE cells can monitor how your lamp's going, whether or not the lamp's been blown, um, how the health, the health of your lighting scheme, and they can actually report that all back to base. So a road authority um, in the future could monitor its lighting scheme without having to, to leave the office. And I know big roads are uh, starting to think about using smart PE, PE cells in the future. But anyway, I think from you know, trends in lighting, they're probably the two most important. You know, there was, um, there is um, active reactor technology for high pressure sodium um, to reduce the energy efficiency and extend the life, but I think that technology is probably going to get overrun by LEDs. Anyway, so new trends in lighting. Um, 
Are there any questions? Thank you for that, James. We have had a couple of questions, and um, just to our audience, thank you for your patience with us. We did go a little bit over time, and if anybody does need to leave to go to an urgent meeting, perhaps, um, please feel free. Um, we might stay back for a few more minutes, and as this session is being recorded anyway, uh, you can always listen back to what you've missed, if you like. Um, just a quick note before I shoot those questions through to James. Um, when the webinar does conclude, uh, a pop-up box will come up on your screen and it's a, a survey that we're asking everyone to please fill in. Um, obviously, we're looking to ever improve our webinar program and the only way we can do that is through your feedback. So it will only take one short minute of your time. All right, James, um, a question here regarding the placement of light fittings and poles and things. And, and for example, if something is knocked over um, in a road crash incident. Is there ever any confusion as to, well, is that the state road authorities' problem to fix or is it the, the local council's problem to fix? Who, how is it decided, um, you know, who rectifies the situation? Uh, yes, that does happen. Um, it's, 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 it's right. Okay, so regarding local councils or state road authorities, there's going to be a demarcation um, arrangement where the state road authority um, jurisdiction ends and the local council jurisdiction starts on local streets. Um, if it's metered lighting, if it's, if it's, oh, I won't say metered, if it's um, lighting that is owned and operated by the road authority. So in Victoria, we would call that metered lighting. In Queensland, for instance, you would call that rate three lighting. Um, it is the responsibility of the road authority to reinstate any damaged lighting on things that's owned and operated by themselves. If it's lighting that is owned and operated by the distribution business, then, then the majority of the time if there's any accident damage, that's going to be rectified by the distribution business. And it's irregardless of whether or not it's on a local road or an arterial road, their lighting, they fix it. Um, having said that, down here in Victoria they have two lists of approved fittings. They have standard fittings like standard poles, brackets and luminaires and they will replace those whenever they're damaged. They also have approved non-standard um, fittings and they will, they will erect and maintain and operate those fittings, but if they ever need to be replaced, they're to be provided by the customer or the road authority. So, so you can get um, instances where a pole gets damaged, right, and it just lies on the side of the road for a long period of time. I've got one outside of our office that's been lying there for probably about six months, maybe eight months. Um, the longest I've seen is probably about 12 months, where the distribution business is waiting for the road authority to provide this frangible pole because it's a non-proved, non-standard item. Um, and if the road authority doesn't know about it, it just it doesn't doesn't happen. So. Um, Confusion and okay, so so that covers that covers you know distribution businesses, um, road authorities. Sometimes you can have some confusion when a pole gets hit, whether it's actually part of a, a metered scheme or a road authority scheme or an adjacent distribution company scheme. Down here in Victoria, we we use curved um, lighting brackets for um, um, distribution company schemes. We use 400 mil pits. For Vic Road schemes, we use 600 mil pits and straight outreach brackets. Now, the majority of the times, that will that will give you clear demarcation between the two schemes. Vic Road also puts a different type of pole number on its poles. The distribution businesses have a, a, a certain pole labelling um, scheme as well. Um, but there is confusion. There is confusion, and it, and it, it does it um it it is it does become a problem every now and then. 
Alrighty, we might take one more question just because we have gone over a little bit. So um, I do apologise if we can't get to your question today. However, um, you can always uh, get in touch with either myself or James. Uh, our contact details will be sent out to you after the webinar. Uh, a question here from Alfred. Alfred's asked, can you please elaborate why we disregard Category P lighting requirements when the road situation, uh, sorry, when the, I might start that one again. Sorry, Alfred, I, I buggered that up one a little bit. So can you please elaborate why we disregard Category P lighting requirements when the road situation comprises of both Category P and V? For instance, a pathway on the side of the main road. Yes, yep, okay. Um, in the standard, and I'd have to actually spend a bit of time um, finding exactly whereabouts in the Australian standard it is right, but that is because um, the assumption assumption is if you've, if you've lit an arterial road to V category standard, you're going to have more than enough spill lighting to light an adjacent footpath. Now, if that footpath is, you know, 20 metres away from the road and there's vegetation in between the footpath and the Category B lighting in the road, well then that might not be the case and you need to consider them separately. But if you're talking about a footpath that's, that's directly adjacent to a V Category road, then you will get plenty of spill light from that V V category lighting scheme, enough that it will actually cover the footpath. Now that's where I was saying that with LEDs, that might not necessarily be the case, and I think the Australian standard needs to just have a have a think about um, that particular requirement because LEDs don't spill light the same way that high pressure sodiums or metal halide lights do. Alrighty, thank you for your question Alfred and I hope we've answered that for you today. Um, we've had a couple of questions regarding the, um, the recording of this webinar and also the presentation material so I'll just uh, reiterate ladies and gentlemen that yes, once the webinar has concluded everybody will uh, be sent a copy of the presentation material and also the recording of the webinar so you can listen back at your leisure. On that note, thank you very, very much, James, for all your hard work in putting together today's presentation and uh, also your time today to deliver it for us. Um, I certainly have a greater appreciation for road lighting, which I, I have to admit I, I didn't have much of prior to today, but I think um, those sorts of things like clearances and, and whatnot I'll, I'll be paying more attention to and, and no doubt we'll be chatting more and more about this sort of thing because you've definitely sparked an interest. Um, thank you to our audience who's joined us today. Again, sorry that we went a little bit over time, but we hope you found the content beneficial. Please do fill in the survey and please do join us next time. Thank you, James, and thank you, everyone. No worries. Pleasure.